thank you for showing up. Uh, today we have a very, very special guest, Professor Brian Kaplan from the Department of Economics at George Mason University. Uh, he's working mostly in the field of economics, political economy. Uh, we have uh, three uh, of his books published into, uh, translated into Polish, very, very good books. Uh, Myth of the Rational Voter, um, The Case Against Education, and uh, Open Borders, of course. Uh, what I really like and I admire about this economist is the fact that he gets interested in the particular topic, decides to write a book about it, studies it first uh, in detail, and then once, once he's done, he moves on to other topics, uh, deciding not to uh, devote too much time in, the, in, in just one particular uh, small aspect of, of social sciences. Um, I'm really, really honored to introduce him. Please give him a warm welcome. All right, it's fantastic to be here. It's fantastic to be introduced by a man who has not introduced anyone in two years. All right, I'm very excited to see everyone live in person. So happy to be here in Poland. And now let's talk about immigration. So I have many different versions of this talk. You're getting the pragmatic version. All right, this is the pragmatic version. So what's the word for pragmatic in Polish? Pragmatic. Pragmatic, okay. A cognate. I'm looking for cognates. I have a lot of trouble finding cognates, so. Uh, now here I am uh, taking a slogan from uh, Michael Clemens, uh, economist in DC, who um, is very likely being uh, going to come to George Mason University. So we, we just made him an offer to become a professor with us. So I hope he says yes. Let's all hope he says yes. Or you can e you can email him and say everyone in Poland is hoping that you take the job at George Mason. Michael, please do it. All right. So he has the slogan: trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk. Uh, do you guys remember the reference? Have you heard the line, there are no $20 bills on the sidewalk? Right, it's a famous slogan that economists have. The idea is, well, if you think that you see $20 on the sidewalk, well, if it was really there, what would have happened? Someone would have come and picked it up. Therefore, it can't really be there. Now, I got to about the age of 30 before I ever actually saw $20 bills on the sidewalk. And strangely, it was right outside my office at the economics department. So when I saw $20 bills on the sidewalk, I actually looked around for hidden cameras to see is this an experiment to see whether economists will just say, can't be there, illusion, right? But I did go and pick it up, it was real, but there was another time I found $40 bills in a grocery, outside a grocery store. Still, I've gotten to 50 years of age, and only twice have I ever found that kind of money lying on the sidewalk. So the model is reasonable. It says if it was there, it would have been picked up. And yet, economists who have looked at immigration have said this is really a case of not just a $20 bill on the sidewalk, it's a trillion dollar bill on the sidewalk, an enormous economic benefit that we are ignoring. The key difference is that how many people did it take to pick up $20 bills on the, $20 on the sidewalk? Just one person. Do you need to go and have a vote where a million people agree the million dollars exists? No, just one person picks it up. But to realize the benefits of immigration, you must convince a country that they are real. Has anyone here ever convinced a country of anything? Right now, I haven't either. It's very hard to convince a country of something. Right? And that is the story I'm going to tell. All right, so let me just start with the social value of labor mobility. All right, so in free labor markets, the normal pattern is that workers move from places where wages are low to places where wages are high. If you have wages that are high in the cities, there are poor workers in the country, workers tend to move from the country to the city, something that we see all over the world. Right? Obviously, it benefits the workers themselves when they move from a, from a place where wages are low to a place where wages are high. But the workers who move are not the only beneficiaries. They're not the only people who gain. Right? Am, I t am I talking too fast? Is this okay? Speed, okay. speed, is, speed is good? Okay. All right. So why is there a gain to people other than the worker who moves? Uh, the answer is that wages and productivity are very closely linked in a market economy. There's a reason why Tom Cruise makes $30 million a movie. Because if Tom Cruise quits the movie, there is no movie. Like the person who does the hats, doing makes hats for people, that person quits, that will not destroy the movie. Right? So that person's productivity is much lower, they get paid a lot less. Right, so we see normally workers who earn low wages 
are also workers who produce very little value. Workers who earn high wages normally produce very high value. What this means is that when a worker moves in order to get more money for himself, they are also increasing the amount of wealth they produce for society. When you move from a low paid job to a high paid job, you are moving from a job where you are producing only a little amount for the world to a job where you're producing a lot for the world. Right? And importantly, this is not just true for high skilled workers. Many people study immigration will say, isn't it great when someone moves from a low paid tech job to a high paid tech job? That's good. Right? But what, what about when someone moves from a low paid janitor job to a high paid janitor job? It's the same argument. It's the same argument. When there are some way, when working for a janitor at Google, maybe there you make twice as much as a janitor for a small store in a rural area. What's the difference? The, in both cases, the janitor is helping other people save time because if the janitor doesn't clean up the trash, someone, some other worker will. But when you save the time of the very high skilled workers at Google, you are contributing more to society than when you save the time of someone who is doing less. All right, now this logic, almost no one will deny it inside of a country. Inside of a country, when people move from one job to another, people can see, yes, there is a gain not just to the worker, there is a gain to our country. But the logic also works just as well across national borders. Right? When workers move to higher wages, they also enrich the world. So an example I often ask Americans is this. How much could you accomplish in Haiti? Haiti is the poorest country in the entire Western Hemisphere. Right? How much could you accomplish there? If you take an American and you just put them with a parachute, drop them in Haiti and say, try your luck, see what you can do. Right? Their earnings are going to be much lower because the Haitian economy is so much less productive. Right? Or I also have a thought experiment in the book where I say, imagine that you have farmers in Antarctica. You have farmers in Antarctica. They work very hard, but the conditions are so terrible for agriculture. Farming the snow, their productivity is very low. They have a miserable life. What happens if you move those Antarctican farmers to another country with better conditions? Like you move them to Argentina. Like part of the answer is, well, it is much better for the Antarctican workers. The Antarctican workers now have a much better life. But that's not the only answer. You also should say, well, those Antarctican farmers will be able to grow much more food in Argentina. And they will not eat all the extra food that they grow. Instead, what they will do is sell most of the extra food on the world market, which lowers the world price of food, which then benefits everyone that consumes food. Or an example that is very current right now. If you look at the per capita GDP of Ukraine, it's about $4,000. For Poland, it's about four times that. This means that you can reasonably expect that when Ukrainian workers, so when Ukrainian migrants get jobs in Poland, they are going to not just be earning much more, they will also be producing much more than they were producing in Ukraine. Some of this gain, of course, goes to the workers, but also that extra productivity will be enjoyed by the consumers of those products, right? If the Ukrainian workers are producing agriculture, they're producing manufacturing, a lot of those products will be exported and the gains will go to people all over the world. If they're producing services, if they're, if they're opening restaurants, those gains almost by definition can only be enjoyed by people that are nearby. So for services, these are products that will be consumed mostly by Polish consumers, right? So then what is the main point of immigration restrictions. What is the main point? The main point is really this, to stop economically beneficial movement from happening. That's the point of the law. In the absence of the law, people will move to higher wages and thereby produce more for themselves and the world. The point of the law is to say, no, stop, stop. You are not allowed to move. You have to stay behind in a country where your productivity is lower. There are many people, especially in the United States, who actually will say, we have open borders already. The laws don't work. We have no enforcement at all. But this is completely crazy. Whatever else I say, this is just flat, completely wrong. We can see this in many ways. So most obviously, you can take a look at black market prices. People pay money in order to cross the border illegally. If you could cross the border legally without any, without any enforcement, would you pay money to someone 
to go and help you get across illegally? Right? Probably not. Would you pay thousands of dollars, which for, for rural Mexicans would be several years' wages, would you pay three years' worth of, worth of wages to do something that is free? Right? Of course not. That's crazy. Right? So you and that actually, so being smuggled from Mexico, that's the cheapest country to get in to, from the United States. If you want to get in from, say, Pakistan, that would be $75,000. Right? Someone's going to pay $75,000 for something that's actually easy. That's crazy. Uh, we also have large global surveys just asking people, would you like to permanently move to another country? And we see that over a billion people on Earth say that they would like to move. At least, a billion, at least over a billion want to move for work. Somewhat, we have somewhat fewer people want to move permanently. There's a lot of people who say they want to move. Right? Also, if you like experiments, there is actually an annual experiment that the United States runs, accidentally, uh, because we have an immigration lottery. We really do. We have an immigration lottery. It's called the diversity lottery. So this means that we take applications from, let's see, every year, you know, let's see, it would be about 15 million immigrants in a usual year. And then we let in about, let, let in less than 1%. Less than 1% win the lottery. And out of those that win, about 80% 80 80 come. Right? So, and then they're able to, you're also able to bring immediate family. So when you go and do the math, you can see that if we just went and stamped everyone's everyone, everyone wins, then the United States would be getting over 20 million additional immigrants per year. Right? And this is actually an understatement for many reasons. One is that the largest countries that send immigrants to the US, so Mexico, China, and India, are all barred from the lottery. This is only a lottery for countries that send fewer immigrants. Okay, so that's one reason why actually this understates the number of immigrants that want to come. Right? And on top of this, of course, many people do not apply because they think, I, only, I have less than a 1% chance of winning. It's too much work to do all the paperwork for such a small chance. If you knew you were going to win, then you would, of course, fill out the paperwork. All right. um, so uh, there is overwhelming evidence that very large numbers of people do want to migrate. So that's clear. All right. So what do the restrictions accomplish? What do all these restrictions accomplish? Right. The first and most obvious effect is that they impoverish mankind. You impoverish mankind by trapping human talent in low productivity countries. You impoverish the people who want to move, but you also impoverish their customers. You also impoverish their customers. Now, when economists have done the math, right, so you're like, how much is the harm? How large is the harm? The answers are enormous. These are the largest estimates of any economic harm that we have in the modern world. I would say the only thing that historically would, would compare would just be communism itself. Say, what is impoverishing the world for, uh, for, 70, for 70 years? You know, well, let's, let's see. Well, the Soviet Union was only impoverishing a small part of the world for a while. Large land area, small percentage. Once communism spread to China and Eastern Europe, then you really were impoverishing a very large part of the world. Right, so it's in the same idea of how much poverty is being caused. Anyway, a standard estimate says, look, if anyone could work anywhere, then in the long run, global GDP, or what we sometimes call GWP, gross world product, right? It's this stick that people rarely talk about, gross world product, but it's a perfectly comprehensible idea, right? So you can have the production of a city, the production of a country, the production of the world the production of all humanity is GWP. And this estimate says, look, in a world where anyone could work anywhere, GWP would roughly double. This is why people have talked about trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, as I said. This enormous gain that we are not realizing because we are trapping human talent in countries of birth instead of allowing it to move where it is most useful. All right, this then brings us to the next point. Uh, impoverishing the world impoverishes us. People that are likely to actually be in countries that would receive immigration. Right, so for Poland, actually, so would you say that you are a net sender of migrants or a net recipient of migrants before last month, before this month? So a month ago, was Poland, a Poland was a country probably sending more migrants than receiving, right? Right? So, you know, so like what percentage of Poles have actually now live outside of Poland? Polish citizens outside of Poland. 
And so, like, you know, so at least, at least before Brexit, it was a very high percentage of polls are just in the UK, right? You know, could that be five percent of Polish citizens? Well, like five five percent of, of of work age could it even be higher? Could it even be higher? Hmm? Yeah. So let's see. So let's see. You've got a population what thirty eight million? Yeah. Right. So thirty eight million, and then yeah, I mean, like if you subtract out kids and the elderly, you've got an old population. So yeah, so like like that could be like, like two million, you know, like could be ten almost ten percent, yeah, very plausibly. All right, All right. Uh, at the same time, of course, there are a lot of people that would love to move to Poland, right? And you now you know, right? You know, we have proof, clear proof. Uh, now you say, well, it's not the greatest proof because they have an extra, re you know, there's push and pull factors, as we say, right? So there's you know, war in Ukraine, but it's also life is much better in Poland. Right, so put those together. All right. Um, now, what is striking is that if you go and read pro-immigration writers, pro-immigration writers focus very closely on high-skilled immigration, usually. They talk about Sergei Brin. You all, you all know Sergei Brin? All right, so Russian immigrant who uh, was a co-founder of Google. Or you know, Albert Einstein. All right, so you talk about the ultra-high-skilled immigrants. People say, look, isn't it great that we get these high skilled immigrants? And yes, it is. But this is a terrible argument for letting in Mexican farmers, right? So, well, what are the odds a Mexican farmer will be the next Albert Einstein? Like, not very likely. And so it more, sounds more like wishful thinking. And what's striking to me, again, is that even when people are, consider themselves pro immigration, normally they focus very heavily on high skilled migration which is only a very tiny percentage of people on Earth want to come, because most human beings on Earth are not high-skilled. Most human beings on Earth are not high-skilled. So if all of your argument revolves around it's great to get high-skilled workers, it's great to have IT workers, then you really only have an argument for the immigration of a small share of the world, and everyone else really, by implication, you're saying they're not so good. All right. Now, the rare analysts who do talk about these trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk that I'm talking about, uh, most of them will just say, all right, fine. All right, a trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, yes, but who cares? It's like, who cares? Who cares about trillions of dollars of gains? That doesn't matter to you? And say, like, well, look, almost all of the gains go to the immigrants themselves, so what difference does it make? All right, now this is strange on many levels. In one way, it is strange because we have a whole field called development economics, which, which talks about how important it is to go and improve life around the world. Sometimes there's actually an economist who works on both immigration and development. Do you know about Paul Collier, who wrote The Bottom Billion? Famous economist, he wrote a book, The Bottom Billion, all about how it's terrible that there's global poverty and we have to really think hard about how to improve it. He also wrote a book about Exodus, about how we really need to stop low-skilled immigration. These two books seem very hard to reconcile. It's like one book says we should really care about them, the other book says, eh, well, we can't, we can't worry about them too much. Anyway, so that's one, one way that it's strange. But the deeper reason why this is strange is that we have a lot of examples throughout economic history when there were large increases in production. And in 100% of these cases, the gains were not primarily enjoyed by just a few people. Instead, they were very broadly shared. Right. So just think about things like the internet. Did the internet mainly just benefit computer programmers? They got, yes, computer programmers got some benefit out of the internet. But what percentage of the gain did they get? Remember, so much of the internet is free. There's a lot of people enjoying the product and paying nothing for it. Obviously, a very large share of the gain goes to people that had, were not working in the computer industry. They did nothing to create the industry. It's rather just competition leads the benefits to actually be passed on to consumers. Right? Or think about vaccines. Do vaccines mainly benefit pharmaceutical companies? It's like crazy. Right? You know, pharmaceutical companies, were you know, maybe they got $10 billion total. The world got many, trillion dollar, many trillions of dollars of gain not only from life saved, but also from revival of economic activity. If you then go and look at those, you'll see like, you know, 10 billion for the people that made the vaccines, trillions for all the people who received the vaccines. 
the gains are very widely shared and not merely going to a few people that were closely connected to the innovation. Same thing goes for the Industrial Revolution. When you create factories to make clothes, does this mean that all the gains go to the owner of the factories? No way. Or the, you know, most of the gains go to all the people who now get to have extra clothes. Right? You might have heard of the origin of the German word uh, Rauber, which we also have in English, robber. I didn't know, from Raub, from cloth. I right? know, like, what? Says, well, in the medieval period, one of the most valuable things that a regular person would own would be their one set of clothes. Right? You don't have, it costs so much. You own one set of clothes. And so when a robber finds you in the forest, they steal your clothes. Right? That's where the word, the word, word comes from. Right? And this was a time when there's so productivity in clothing is so low that it takes months or years to afford a set of clothes. The Industrial Revolution comes along and suddenly clothes are cheap. Suddenly a regular person could own 10 shirts, 10 pairs of pants. Right? It's not like the owners of the factories were wearing a million shirts. Obviously, you produce this much larger number of shirts and then you sell them. And when you sell them, the price of shirts goes down and the benefits then become enjoyed by a large number of people. All right, so we have all these other examples throughout economic history where there were large increases in production. We've always seen that the benefits were widely shared because of competition. All right, and therefore, it is, it is very likely that immigration restrictions, by drastically reducing the production of the world, are impoverishing not just migrants, they are impoverishing all the people that would be the customers of the migrants, right? So you're familiar with, with the, say, or the, with the uh, phrase trickle-down economics? Trickle-down economics, so a trickle. What's, what's Polish for trickle? Okay. Whatever, the, whatever you just said. <laughs> yes. A trickle, a little drop. So this was an insult that people made against free market economists in the, uh, mostly in the 1980s. It said, look, you want to go and help the rich and then hope that a little bit of the benefit to the rich trickles down to everybody else. And I say, no, it is not trickle down economics. Uh, it is what I call Niagara Falls economics. Do you, have you heard of Niagara Falls? Yes, it's a great tourist site. It really is amazing, actually. It's one of the best things you can see in the US or Canada because it's on the border. So you can see either way, actually, the Canadian view is the better view. Uh, so I don't know whether Canada is letting people from Poland even visit right now. They've been so crazy during COVID. So yeah, I say it's not trickle-down economics. It is Niagara Falls economics. Uh, let's see. So I did. So in the book, actually, let me show you. So in the book, I actually do draw this. This. All right. Yes. So that's the picture. Uh, if you're wondering what's why I'm in a barrel. Um, in, the, in earlier periods, there were idiots that would see whether they could survive going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, right? Do not do this. <laughs> no, many died. But in a picture, it's perfectly safe. So it's no, no, no harm, but, so, but anyway. But uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, so this is not trickle, you know, so Open Borders is not trickle down economics, right? It is Niagara Falls economics. Uh, what, what is the largest waterfall in Europe? Don't know. What's the largest waterfall in Poland? You must have something. You've got, you've got mountains. You've got to have good waterfalls. All right. All right. So like that, but better. Okay. All right. All right. So what are we losing? What are we losing as a result of excluding immigrants? So tons of cheap products. Let's see. Do you have Walmart in Poland? Don't have Walmart. So what would be the closest thing to Walmart in Poland? What, what is a store, like a very large store full of very cheap stuff? All right, or, or well, well, I mean, if you just don't have an answer, then I can say, all right, here's what you're missing, Walmart. <laughs> have you ever been to a Walmart in another country? Yes. Uh, let's see, you're in, you, do you have Costco here? No. Costco. Costco is you know, the higher quality version of Walmart. It's a different company. But you know, Costco is a store where the sizes are enormous, the prices are very low, and the quality is very high, right? It's all true, it's all true, right? And yes, and if you want to improve Polish birth rates, you must get Costco here. Costco is for big families. Uh, so yes, I only have four kids, 
Yeah, so these are these are my good sound hooks. Hold on. Yes. All right. Oh, I have to kill these. That's ah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so these are my my four kids. I only have four. Without Costco, it would be so hard to raise a family, right? <laughs> Not just the price. No, so the prices are great. The sizes are great, but also the time you save. The time you save because everything that you need practically is at Costco. Uh, everything you know, so. so not quite, it's not Amazon everything. You do have Amazon here, right? You do have Amazon, right? Um, so the, you know, Costco is where you would get things that would not work well at Amazon, like food, for example, right? So, or your know, clothes where you want to actually be able to try it and see if it's the right size. So, yeah, so I, I, it is very believable to me that Costco has increased American fertility by like 0.02 by its, uh, per, uh, children per women by itself. Right, that is totally believable because it just makes having a family so much cheaper, not just in money, but in time. Not just in money, but in time. All right. So we are, so uh, one thing you would get from immigrants is having a lot more businesses like this. Right. Also, you know, tons of cheap services. Cheap services. Right. So you know, everything from your know, restaurants to childcare, gardening, like all the things where you need another person to do it. Right. These are all areas where immigrants typically do focus. Uh, these are, uh, or these are especially for lower skilled immigrants. These are very good jobs, right? a big improvement for them, but it's not just an improvement for them. It also is a big improvement in the lives of parents, right? And families. Yes. Yeah, so another very thing, a great thing you can do for Polish birth rates, of course, is to let in a lot more nannies, a lot more nannies because nannies make it much easier to raise a family. Now, another way that natives gain is with an increase in real estate values. This, when you have population go up, this does raise the price of housing, especially in the short run. Right? You know, it depends upon whether you allow the building more housing. That's important. Right? That's my, my next graphic novel is about housing. We can talk about that in the question and answer. The important thing to know here is that almost all real estate in the United States is owned by Americans. And I am going to bet that almost all real estate in Poland is owned by Poles. True? Yes. Uh, no, not true. So you know, like what percentage of Polish land would be owned by Poles? I mean, if you're counting housing. Oh, you mean land. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but all, all, yeah, 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 really, yes. Land. All right. All right, another gain that you were missing out on. So entrepreneurship and innovation. And again, while it is good to think about Google and Facebook and other high-tech innovation, it's important to remember that's only one small part of entrepreneurship. Someone opening up an Afghan restaurant, that is entrepreneurship as well. And again, it's something that is unlikely to happen without the immigrants, especially initially because it is the immigrants that go and know how to actually make the food. Like people that are in Poland are unlikely to know how to go and do it. All right. Now, uh, one very common complaint immediately is to say, well, what about the effect on native jobs and wages? What about the effect on native jobs and wages? And here the answer is very simple. Look, you have to consider both the costs and the benefits. So on the one hand, if immigrants come and compete with you for a job that is bad for you and that reduces your wages. On the other hand, if immigrants produce things that you buy that is good for you and that increases your wages. So you need to think about, do the immigrants produce what you produce, bad for you, or do they produce what you consume that is good for you? Importantly, you need to focus on the net effect, the combined effect of the two things. For me, immigrant professors are bad. Right? Immigrant professors are bad for me economically because I compete with them. On the other hand, when someone opens, when an immigrant opens up an Afghan restaurant, that is purely good for me. He is not competing for my job. He is competing for my money. He is competing for my money, and when he does that, he makes my money more, more valuable. Right now, if you're saying, hmm, well, but what would the net effect be? Well, let me just bring you to what I believe is the most important principle of economics. The most important principle of economics is this. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. The overwhelmingly most important determinant of whether people in a country have a high standard of living is whether they have a high standard of production. Productive countries are rich countries, Unproductive countries are poor countries. What this means is that whenever you're thinking about economic policy, the most important thing to think about is, is this increasing the production of our society? 
It's increasing the production of your society. This means there's a larger amount of production that will be enjoyed by people there. All right now, finally, so if you think that Americans or Poles or people in the receiving country should get even more from immigrants, uh, the prudent policy is to say, yes, you're welcome. We love you. We're glad to have you, but we're going to charge you extra. We're going to charge you an admission fee. We're going to go and charge you extra taxes. And that this way we will get a larger share, right? And then you could use these funds to help natives who lose. I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying this is much better than saying no. Saying yes, if is better, not only for immigrants, but for the receiving society, then saying no way will not be allowed. Uh, which brings me to something controversial that I'm going to say. Maybe you'll say, what are the best country, what countries in the world have the best immigration policies? I'll say, yes, it's clear. The Gulf monarchies have the best immigration policies in the world. How can you say that? Aren't they mean to immigrants? Don't they go and steal their passports and otherwise mistreat them? There's some of that. I don't I, that stuff is bad, but here's the main thing that makes the immigration policies in, in the Gulf monarchies good. They take a lot of immigrants, an enormous number compared to their population. And so for like United Arab Emirates, about 85% of the country is foreign born, 85%. They take an enormous number of immigrants and they don't just take doctors and petroleum engineers, they take low skilled workers and those low skilled workers normally would be earning five times as much as they would back home in Pakistan, right? It does not mean that they shouldn't treat them better, but far better to go and let in a very large number of immigrants in, including low-skilled workers, and then not be so nice to them than to say, no, you can't come, tough luck, we don't want you. Right, so why not? Why not? Why not? Why is it we don't see any country that has open borders? Why is it the countries that are closest to open borders are monarchies? Right, what's going on? Well, I talk a lot about these estimates of the economic gains, trillions of dollars of benefits. And I know from experience that talking about numbers very rarely changes people's minds. It changes the minds of reasonable people, but there's not that many reasonable people. All right. Uh, now, what's going on? Well, one problem could be just that my numbers are crazy. Possible. Uh, what's striking is that people know the numbers, even critics very rarely say these numbers are just totally wrong, totally exaggerated, right? And again, we're like, how, where do these large numbers come from? Why, do they, why are they so enormous? Basically, you're multiplying two big things. You're multiplying a very large number of immigrants want to come, probably well, well over a billion immigrants want to actually come, times an enormous gain for per, per person, because the difference in earnings and productivity between rich countries and poor countries is so large. Right? So if you take a billion people and you multiply their earnings by five, that is an enormous gain to humanity. Right? So you take one big thing, the number of immigrants that want to come, multiply it by another big thing, which is the gain in productivity per immigrant, multiply two big things together, you get an enormous number, and that's where these trillions of dollars of gains are actually coming from. Right, so why is the people do not want to go and let in immigrants? Well, normally people say, fine, these numbers are okay, but there's some offsetting concerns. There's some offsetting concerns, All right? So top concerns people, that people discuss. One is just protecting native taxpayers. We need to protect native taxpayers. Immigrants are going to come and they will use a lot of services, barely pay any taxes. They will be a burden on our society. Another one is protecting our culture. Immigrants are from a very different culture. They're going, their culture is bad, ours is good, and they are going to mess our culture up. And then the last one, which is especially popular among libertarians that are opposed to immigration, right, is that immigrants are going to take away our liberty. All right, so let's talk about how serious these objections are. You notice I do have chapters on each of these in Open Borders, if you've seen the book. All right, so protecting taxpayers. Um, let me just start with telling you how crazy the American welfare state was during COVID, right? So during COVID, most people that lost their jobs got a raise. They actually got more money to not work than they did when they were working. How much? Well, so during, uh, so during COVID, a, uh, a low-skilled unemployed worker would usually be getting about $40,000 per year. 
So let's see, in, what is it, Zlotsky? Zlotsky? Zlotsky. 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 In Zlotsky, in Zlot, in where you know, we're talking about like 200,000 Zlotsky per year to not work. Does that sound like a lot of money? Yeah. To not work? Yeah, that's a lot of money. So this is what the American welfare state was paying during the peak of COVID. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what was going on? Well, so we paid normal unemployment benefits plus a very large additional benefit on top. Right. So anyway, uh, now during normal times, you know, it is not nearly that much, but still the American welfare state pays a, a very large amount to not work compared to what you get for working in Haiti. All right. The story then says, look, immigrants are going to come to abuse the system. And furthermore, it's pointing out that there are important ways where the U.S. welfare state is less subject to abuse than in European countries. So in the U.S., at least, normally benefits expire. They run out. So I was lecturing in Oxford this summer. Big contrast between the U.S. and U.K. So in the U.S., during normal times, unemployment insurance only lasts for 26 weeks. After 26 weeks, the money stops. Uh, in the UK, they said the money is, goes forever. If you lose your job, you can get government money forever. Right, so how does it work in Poland? Can you get government money forever if you lose your job? Or do they? Like a year or something. Like, like a, year, a year? What's that? 18, 18 months? Not, is this not, the, not, not, uh, not in the one period. Ah, it's like yes. ah, uh, not in one period. 18 months in some part mm -hmm. of the time. And Was this be, is this before COVID or is this now? Or, or do you need to do? Okay. Any case. So, you know, and you can see that while your payments are going to be less than the U.S., still, compared to Afghanistan, probably pretty good, right? All right. Now, a key fact about all welfare states that I've ever studied, I know the U.S. best, but I'm almost sure it applies to Poland as well, is that actually most of the money does not even go to the poor. It mostly goes to the old. Right? Most money actually goes to the old and not the poor. Um, what this means is that when people actually go over the numbers in detail and do the math, there's almost no serious researcher uh, for the US that finds a big negative effect of immigration for the US. Right. The numbers are less favorable for Europe, so I want to be honest, but the difference is not so great. The difference is not so great. Now, the important thing to understand about all of this is that while this is actually requires very detailed arithmetic to go and estimate these numbers, Almost everyone who has an opinion on the fiscal effect of immigration has not done any math at all. How do people figure out what the economic effect of immigration is on the budget without doing any math? Well, they do it with, wishful, with the power of wishful thinking. You do wishful thinking. So I like immigrants, therefore immigrants are great for the budget. I don't like immigrants, therefore immigrants are bad for the budget. Right? That is the kind of thing that most people do. In this book, again, I tried not to go and find what pro-immigration people said. I tried to find the most boring, neutral estimates, so I relied very heavily on the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, of course, any time you are doing these estimates, there's always assumptions that you can argue with, but I did try to find the ones where you were, it was most clear they just spent a lot of time in the numbers without a lot of ideology. Right now, if it just seems too good to be true, one important thing to understand about government spending is a lot of it is what economists call non-rival. This means the cost of the government spending does not depend much on population. Take national defense. If Poland manages to go and have a baby boom, you need a baby boom. If you manage to have a baby boom, would it then make sense to say, well, now that we have all these babies, we need to make our military bigger? Right? Maybe you think you need to have it bigger because of Putin, but not the babies. It's not the baby's fault. Right? So look, we can defend the babies just as well with the, same, with the military that we had. Right? That, you know, the, there's no additional cost of, for, the, for the military of having these babies here. Right? And that is how at least a lot of government spending works, is the cost has very little to do with population. Right? You know, another great example is vaccines. Right? Once you come, you know, like there's a large cost of finding a vaccine, but you can then share that vaccine with a million people, 100 million people, a billion people, seven billion people, right? You really can just take the idea once you have it and have it be enjoyed by the whole world, right? Well, so what this means is that at least for a lot of the budget, what immigrants are doing is spreading the cost rather than adding to the cost. Not true for everything. So yes, so you all know what's going on with Ukrainian refugees right now. And yes, those are not good examples of non-rival costs. Those are costs that are highly rival. 
And although I understand that like so much of what's going of uh, the help for Ukrainians is coming from charity, right? So that's so people just opening up their houses and there's like a little government money there, although it seems like a lot of people, they're not doing it for the money, they're doing it just because they want to help, right? But anyway, so even if this complaint were true, even if it were true that immigrants are a fiscal, are, are a fiscal burden, so why not admit them freely but limit eligibility for benefits? Which, by the way, is what the Gulf monarchies do, right? Imagine if the Gulf monarchies had a rule that said we have to share our oil money with every immigrant. Would United Arab Emirates be 85% foreign-born if they had to go and share the oil money with anyone who came? No, right? This is a very important part of the policy, is the oil money is for citizens. We welcome immigrants. We need these immigrants. Otherwise, how would we spend our oil money? But they don't share. They are not, you know, they don't share the money. Right? And in this way, they actually create opportunities that otherwise would not exist, right? It's very important to understand this connection. We're like, yes, if you, if you are going to go and be very generous with immigrants, then there's also going to be a lot of pressure not to let them in, right? If you have a policy like Sweden, anyone who gets here, we give great treatment. And that's why we don't want any, we don't want them to come because they are such a burden. In the United Arab Emirates, they have a very different attitude. Like we don't share and you can come here and you can work as a maid or in childcare or in construction, not just high tech jobs, all kinds of jobs, like which, if you go there and you'll see, gee, they live so much worse than people in the United Arab Emirates. But again, why did they come from a village in Pakistan to work as a maid in UAE? Because things, if you look at them and you say, like your life here in UAE doesn't, it seems bad. They came from Pakistan because their life in Pakistan was much worse, much worse. All right, so protecting culture. Um, you know, you may be puzzled by the idea that Americans want to protect their culture. So you may think we don't have a culture. But I'm not going to argue that. I'll say Americans believe they have a culture. When people say, oh, there's no such thing as like an American nationality, Americans think there is. Americans feel very strongly about this. Right? You know, my dad, my dad is 83, and you know, you're like, I'm an American. And, you know, you, like then things were good in the 1950s when we were all just Americans. And this is how he feels. Yes, there is a lot of worry that immigrants are destroying American culture. Um, starting with they don't learn English. They don't learn English. I can't tell you how many times I've given a talk like this and then afterwards someone says, look, what you're saying makes sense, but I really hate it when I go to the bank machine, the ATM machine, or what do you call it here? Bancomat. Yeah, Bancomat, right? And it, says, I have to press, and it says press one for English, two for Spanish. It makes me so mad, <laughs> right? They're a very common American reaction. It's like, it's like one button, what's the big deal? But no, very upsetting. All right, so that's you know, one big complaint is they don't learn English. But of course, there's also complaints about how they're just different. Right, so they wear different clothes or they have different attitudes, different religion, that kind of thing. Right. Now, the problem with these complaints is that some are just hard to measure. The language complaints are very easy to measure. We do have very good data from the census going back over a century on language acquisition of immigrants. And here is what we find. It was never true that first generation immigrants who came as adults generally became perfectly fluent in English because it's almost impossible for an adult to ever learn to speak a foreign language without an accent. Right? It's really hard. Um, there is a mythology that back in the good old days uh, before World War I, immigrants were really committed to learning English and then they all got fluent. But when we look at the actual numbers, we see that's not true. Right? And today, it is also not true. First generation immigrants who come as adults, they generally never become perfect in English. But what we do see is that both to today and in the past, second generation immigrants, the children of the original immigrants, do almost always attain total fluency. Even Mexicans, who Americans think of as the group that is especially unlikely to learn English. The real difference between Mexican immigrants, or really Spanish-speaking immigrants, and others is not that, the, that Spanish speakers do not learn English. It's that Spanish speakers retain Spanish. Every other immigrant group loses, the second generation generally loses the language of their parents. It's like Korean immigrants. Second generation are not good at speaking Korean generally. 
Chinese immigrants are not good at second generation, are not good at speaking Chinese, but second generation Mexicans or Guatemalans are good at speaking Spanish, but they still also speak English. Right? Given how hard Americans try to teach foreign languages, we have to spend many years not learning other languages, right? So you think that people would be happy, but no. All right. Now, for other measures of culture, it's harder because it's just hard to measure exactly what it is. Uh, if you just think about culture, one thing you would say is, you know, America's cultural centers like New York and California are places of very high immigration. Right? It's just simple points, uh, not totally convincing, but still notable. Uh, but what, you, what is really striking is when people say, look, we used to have a great system for assimilation in the old days, but now we have multiculturalism and we've lost the ability to assimilate people. All right, it's an interesting point. But at, you know, and it'll, and sometimes people say, well, look, it's, maybe it's not multicultural, and maybe it's just changes in technology. We now have much better communications, much better transportation in the past. A hundred years ago, when you moved from Sicily to the United States, that was really just saying goodbye to your home country forever because communication was basically, you could do a telegram, you could send a letter, not very close contact. Transportation, extremely expensive. You have to do a steamship to go home, which meant that in the past, really, you are basically saying goodbye to your home country for life. Today, communication and transportation are so much better that you can live in one country physically, but, psych but psychologically, you can stay in your other country. Like I have a colleague whose wife is from Taiwan, and every day she basically just lives in Taiwan, right? So she watches Taiwanese television, she talks to her friends in Taiwan, she is not assimilating, right? And that would not have been possible 100 years ago, right? So it is true that in some ways it has become easier not to assimilate. However, this misses a very important part of the story, which is precisely because communication and transportation are much better than in the past. There are now many people around the world who pre-assimilate, who assimilate even uh, to receiving countries even though they have never actually lived there, right? Just think about this group. You are all, I assume you all understand English. Maybe you're here just to look at me, but. <laughs> <laughs> look at it, but. Uh, I'm assuming you're here because you can understand what I'm saying. A hundred years ago, this would probably have been almost impossible. A hundred years ago, if an American professor came to Poland, who would he talk to? Let's see, 100 years, yeah, there would be Poland 100 years ago. All right, <laughs> right. So like, it just, like there'd be very few people in Poland would, would speak English, therefore I couldn't have even given this talk. What has happened? You have pre-assimilated. You have assimilated to a high degree to the English-speaking world, even though, let's see, how many people here have ever lived in an English-speaking country? So only one, two, all right. And yet all of you are actually ready to go and move to an English-speaking country and get a job, probably, right? Your English is good enough that you could actually probably immediately begin working in your occupation. My father-in-law from Romania, he showed up in the United States not speaking English. So even though he was a skilled electrician, he had to spend several years working as a janitor in order to learn English, and then he could resume his regular occupation. You are probably all good enough in English to immediately get a job in your current occupation in an English-speaking country. Right? And it's not just language, you also are familiar through, uh, through the internet, through movies, through television, with what life is like in the United States or in an English-speaking country. If you showed up, you would not probably go, oh my God, I can't believe what it looks like here. Right? I'm a bit more surprised, so yeah, Poland looks great to me. Like I'm, I'm, so, I'm so pleased. Right? So, you know, so, like I, 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 you know, so we can talk later, but you know, I've always said, look, shock therapy was great. You know, like it was really important. The countries that did it succeeded. The countries that didn't failed. Like Belarus and Ukraine should have done shock therapy like Poland, right? And now I come here, yes, yes, of course. The facts prove that I'm right. All right anyway, so even if the complaint were true, right, so why not admit anyone who passes a language test or a cultural literacy test? You may wonder what would be on an American cultural literacy test? Name all six characters on Friends, right? <laughs> Rachel Ross, <laughs> right, you do that. Or how many points is an American football touchdown? Right, so it's a little, you know, I understand what would be on the German cultural literacy test. You know, name the greatest German composers of all time. 
right? <laughs> right? All 17 of them. <laughs> All right. And finally, protecting liberty. Now, this is an uh, a excuse that is very popular among libertarians, but also you'll often hear it from American conservatives. And it says this, look, immigrants come from statist countries. And what will they do if they show up in our country? They are going to vote for statism as well. Now, I do have a book which is very consistent with this argument, right? And many people have said, look, how can you write this book and not be worried about it? And my answer is, of course I'm worried about it. I'm, I'm worried about every possible problem with immigration. But there's a difference between worrying and being paranoid, right? Worrying means they say, yeah, like, that's possible. That could be a problem. Like, how severe is the problem? How does it compare to the gains? What are ways that we could go and deal with the problem? And so, you know, when people say, like, aren't you worried? I was like, yes, of course I'm worried. I'm very concerned. Right? I want immigration to work. I don't want people complaining. Right? I want people to say this is great. Right? But anyway, that's the idea. It's like, why is Venezuela so messed up? Well, it's a dictatorship now, but they voted their, themselves into dictatorship. Right? It wasn't, you know, so initially, they were like, oh, international observers said the elections were fair and free. Then they got less fair and less free over time, and now it is just a dictatorship. But anyway, it really looks like Venezuelans believe in socialism. Right? And I will say, what really shocks me is that the horrors of Venezuela did not end all such socialist experiments in Latin America. Right? The fact that you can have Venezuelans fleeing Venezuela and yet Peru can vote into Marxist-Leninist, right? or Chile, I'm like, what the hell is wrong? Like, what are you thinking? I mean, I think that the opposition would just say, do you want to be Venezuela? Says, well, guess what? If you vote, you know, so, so you can't prove that this guy is the next Chavez. Well, you know, really, we, should have, we shouldn't even be wondering. You know, say, so prove that this guy is the next Hitler. Like, no, prove he's not. Like, if there's any doubt in your mind, that should be enough to say, no way will we ever put this person in power. Because once you do, how would you, maybe you can never get rid of this horrible person. Right. But while I am aware of the possible danger of immigrants voting for bad policies, I'll still say when you actually look at the numbers, the danger is much milder than what critics think. Why? Well, so one big factor is that non-natives actually are very unlikely to vote. So in the United States, the foreign-born, even those that are, that, are, that are citizens that are legally allowed to vote, are still very unlikely to vote. And this is true even controlling for other factors. The fact is that when you immigrate to another country, politics is one of the last things that you're worried about. You're worried about getting, you know, getting a good job, finding a place for your family, getting your kids into good schools, helping you know, learning the language. You have real problems. Your goal is not, hmm, now that I'm here, how can I go and change the politics of this country? Right? So this is, this is what we see. Now, I have heard people say, that's what's so bad about immigrants is that they don't get involved in politics. Well, look, if you think they have bad views, you should be happy they're not very political. Now, something else that is worth, worth, worth saying, there is a lot of evidence that immigrants actually reduce the support of natives for the welfare state. Why? Because people do not like helping out groups. The social science on this, it's not perfect because guess what? It's social science. Social science is never perfect. But I think it has high credibility because the people that are doing this research are unhappy with the result. If someone in social science gets a result they're very happy about, they're yes, great, perfect. And it's like, hmm, maybe you just didn't try very hard to double check the work. When someone gets a result that makes them depressed, like, oh no, I'm so depressed about what I found. I consider that highly reliable work because when you don't like the result, what do you do? You, you try to see, well, maybe the result is just not really true. Maybe it's very sensitive to the specification. Maybe there's control variables, so on. A lot of this research comes out of Scandinavia where you have typical Scandinavian social scientists saying, you know, first of all, I believe very strongly in the Swedish welfare state. And secondly, I am very concerned about the immigrants. I am very, a very kind-hearted person who wants to have help people who come from Somalia and other such countries. But then I am worried that if we let in people who do not look as Swedish, it will make, it will undermine Swedish support for our welfare state. 
They look at the numbers and they say, Oh no, it seems that thy fears are untrue. Right? Now, now, this does not mean that immigration has actually made the welfare state shrink. But it does seem that it has been an important constraining force. An important constraining force where it would have grown more than it did in the countries that, were, that led in more immigrants, it seems like it actually reduced the growth rate. Right? So, now of course, if you are a Swedish Social Democrat, it makes sense that you, are, that you are conflicted. On the other hand, if you are someone who loves free markets and human freedom, you should not feel conflicted, you should be happy. It's like, hmm, well this means that we can actually have two good things at the same time. We can have more immigration, and we can also shrink the welfare state simultaneously. I mean, what's going on is that a lot of support for the welfare state is based on the idea of a country as a family, right? Which, if you think about it, is a prescription for authoritarianism. If a country is a family, well, then we all care about each other and we're not going to let each other do things that are bad for each other. Think about how your parents would react if you say, I want to go and climb, and climb mountains. Your parents are going to say, oh, great. That's your life. Live it as you want. Probably your parents are going to say, I don't want you climbing mountains. That's dangerous. No. Or if you want to try hallucinogenic mushrooms, how would your parents feel about that? Right? When people love each other, it is hard to respect your freedom to do your own thing, right? When countries think about themselves too much as being a family, this is very dangerous for human freedom. What you really need in a free society isn't love, it's respect. It's like, this is, it's your life. It's not what I would do with my life. You live your life as you want. I will live my life as, my want, as, as I want. That is the attitude that you need for a free society. So I say that immigration is something that helps push attitudes in the better direction of realizing, look, I shouldn't expect other people in this, in this country to go and live the same way that I want to live. Live and let live, not we are a family and we must all go and protect each other, watch each other, and control each other. Now, last point, even if this complaint were true, even a really true that immigrants were going to have bad political views, so why not just admit immigrants to work and live but not vote? Again, this is what the Gulf monarchies do. They don't really have voting for citizens either. We're not for anything important. Uh, but you know, also probably a big factor in the Gulf monarchies being so open to immigration is they just are not worried that immigrants are going to change their politics. All right, so bigger picture. Uh, so people in the receiving country are not the only beneficiaries of immigration. So there's the immigrants themselves. And then there's indirect benefits for the sending countries. Very important to remember. Right? So people often will say, as they look, but well, what about the people that don't move? What about them? Right? Well, there are a lot of work on this. Uh, one, there is one enormous and obvious gain, which is remittances. What's Polish for remittances? It's the money that you send home to your, country, uh, to your family. What do you call that? Can you say it loudly? All right, whatever that, yes, that, yes, that word. All right, yeah, so I'm just reading that already, the, I think it was like, so before the Ukraine war, the, uh, you know, about 4% of Ukraine's GDP came from remittances, right? And there are many countries like Egypt, for example, where it's a much larger share of their GDP is coming from remittances. So this is one important benefit that immigrants do is they work in another country, they earn much higher wages, and they send money home to their families. Right. Other benefits include business connections, acquiring human capital. You go and you move to another country, you acquire new skills that you would not have acquired in your own country. You, uh, you acquire business connections and then that can allow you to go and go home and use those skills or open a business or maybe you stay in the country and you, and you, uh, and you set up businesses in contact with people you know in your own country. Right. What is the overall? Now, on the other hand, you can say, well, but the country still lost the skills. Here there are some very nice natural experiments that we can look at to understand what is the overall net effect of open borders. Because we do have some countries that where, where, where they do, where they have had open borders with each other. Uh, in the United States, I'll talk, I talk a lot about Puerto Rico and the rest of the United States. You know the story of Puerto Rico? Anyone been to Puerto Rico? All right, so yes. Uh, the US on an absurd pretext declared war on Spain, right? and uh, yes, and, and took a lot of, and took some territory from them, including Puerto Rico, right? And then a few years later, 
The United States Supreme Court ruled that there were open borders between Puerto Rico and the United States. As a result, Puerto Ricans have been able to move to the United States freely for over a century. If you take a look at Puerto Rico, what you'll see is that it is almost the richest island in the Caribbean. It is poor compared to the United States, but very rich compared to the counterfactual of if it had not been part of the United States. Right? And so we see that when you consider all of the possibility of brain drain and so on, still the net effect has been very positive for Puerto Rico. Another good example would be France and French Guiana, another case of open borders between a rich country and a much poorer country. Net effect again is that it is actually the is that the country, the poor country, still winds up benefiting. It's not just the people that move from French Guiana to France; it's also the people that stay behind in French Guiana that benefits. The benefit. All right. So there's vast benefits for people in the receiving countries. And again, the main complaints can be addressed without restricting immigration. Like I said, how can you do that? So, you know, yes, you can come, but we're going to limit benefits. Yes, you can come, but, there are go but you need to go and acquire language fluency first. Yes, you can come, but you can't vote. Right? These are all ways where you can handle the complaints without stopping the immigration. All right, so why has this not happened? Well, I've got several reasons. All right, one is just apathy. It's important to realize the United States does not have open borders even with Canada. Right? We are not like the EU where you have many countries that have open borders with each other. The US does not have open borders with anything that is not US territory. Right? Now, if you talk to Americans and say, why not open borders with Canada? The reaction is not usually, oh, I hate Canadians, they're terrible. Right? Or like, you know, they would destroy us. The reaction is usually just, eh, who cares? Who cares? That's the reaction. So, but like, who cares? How about all the gains that we would get from people being able to move to the country where their productivity is higher? Another big reason, uh, innumeracy, innumeracy, not thinking about the world with math. All right. So simple math question. All right. So what is one trillion minus one billion approximately? <laughs> approximately. One trillion minus one billion approximately equals, you know, the not the equal sign, the, sway, the, oh, the approximation sign, like the wavy sign, right? Approximately equals a trillion, right? This is the kind of thing I'm thinking when someone says, I have to press one for English, two for Spanish. It's like, that is at most a billion dollar problem. How can we even be having a conversation about this when I'm telling you about trillion dollar gains? I think the answer is people are not thinking quantitatively. They're thinking emotionally, like, but it bothers me. I don't like it. So let's not do it. So look, look, I don't like my boss, so I'm not going to go to my job today. It's one where well, it's a, you could make that decision, but it's a very costly decision. All right. And then finally, anti-foreign bias. All right. So again, I talk about anti-foreign bias in the myth of the rational voter. All right. Oh, this is true for all human beings I have ever heard of. All right. So I don't think Americans are especially bad. Right, and let's see. Uh, during the Syrian refugee crisis, many people were saying Poles were especially bad, but now all the bad publicity about Poland is gone. Everyone's talking about how great you are. All right, so now it turns out Poles are not cruel and heartless people. You are warm and kind, wonderful people. Right. Anyway, maybe both. <laughs> There's a little bit of both in everybody. Anyway, uh, what I say in The Myth of Rational Voter is that Foreigners are very emotionally and politically appealing scapegoats. When people complain about budget deficits, very rarely they talk about anything that is quantitatively important, such as we give too much money to old people. That's something where the mass says, yeah, that's a huge problem, right? Or even, look, we, have way too, we need to have more young people. It's a reasonable thing to say. But people like old people of their own country, and so they don't complain about them. Instead, they go and say, well, what about, what about foreigners? Can we blame them? Foreign aid. Americans complain a lot about foreign aid as a cause of budget deficits. Right? It is not anything more than a tiny rounding error. Mathematically, but emotionally, people are very quick to say that it's a huge problem. Right? So, foreigners are a very appealing scapegoats, regardless of the numbers. I think that also is another big part of why people are so resistant to these arguments. All right, so thanks very much, and happy to take questions. Thanks.